All right, so this podcast is all about Newton's third law. There's a lot of things in here that might be tricky, even though it's stated very simply. Just the conceptual stuff can be a little confusing. So I will try to alleviate that for you. So Newton's third law describes something else that happens when one object exerts a force on another object. According to Newton's third law of motion, forces always act in equal but opposite pairs. Equal but opposite. Another way of saying this is for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction, just the way we normally learn Newton's third law. So this means that when you push on a wall, the wall pushes back on you with a force equal in strength to the force that you exerted. So you push on the wall with, say, 100 newtons, the wall is going to push back with another 100 newtons, equal and opposite. So these forces don't actually cancel each other out because the forces are exerted by two objects on each other, and these guys are often called action-reaction force pairs. Now they don't cancel out, you know, it's not there yet, but either force can be considered the action force or the reaction force. The wall pushing on you could be the action force. The reaction could be you pushing on the wall. It's all semantics, all the way you uh, say it. So action and reaction force pairs don't cancel because they act on different objects. The wall pushing on you does not cancel out you pushing on the wall. It might be equal and opposite, but those forces are still there because they're acting on different objects. You're pushing the wall, the wall is pushing you. You and the wall are two different objects, hopefully. Here's a picture of Newton, a very dapper gentleman in his cravats. But Newton's third law of motion says when one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal but opposite force on the first. We already knew this. So the force of this A guy here, force of A on B, this is how we write it, force of A on B is equal to the force of B on A. Even though they're different sizes, they still have the same force because of Newton's third law. It's equal and opposite forces. So this is how a hammer works. So the hammer exerts a force on the nail to the right. The hammer pushes this way, the force of the hammer on the nail. Force of two on one could be force of H on N. And the nail exerts the same force back onto the hammer, but in the left direction, force of the nail on the hammer. So why does this nail go into the wall? It's because we also remember that force equals mass times acceleration from Newton's second law, which means net force. Now the nail has a much smaller mass. Nail has a smaller mass. And the hammer has a big mass. Now, we're going to say that force of the hammer on nail equals the force of the nail on the hammer. But the force of the hammer on the nail equals the mass of the hammer times the acceleration of the hammer. And that's going to equal the mass of the nail times the acceleration of the nail. Now, if this MH is bigger than this MN, that means this AH has to be smaller than the acceleration of the nail. So I'll just throw some numbers in here real quick. I know these aren't really realistic numbers, but it'll help to prove my point. So let's say the hammer is three kilograms and the mass of the nail is one kilogram. We're gonna say that the acceleration, we're gonna say that the force that both of these feel, so the force of the hammer on nail equals 12 newtons. So that means the acceleration of the hammer has to be four meters per second squared. So three times four gives us 12 newtons. So if the nail is one kilogram, which is a freaking big nail, the acceleration has to be 12 meters per second squared. So because it has a bigger acceleration, that's why it goes into the wall. So the nail exerts an equal but opposite force on the hammer to the left. Yeah, I already said that. So you constantly use action-reaction force pairs as you move about. We're always using them even though you don't realize it. So when you jump, you're pushing down on the ground. The ground pushes down on you, or pushes up on you, because it's opposite. So it is the upward force that pushes you in the air. It's actually the earth pushing you up because you're pushing down. And the earth doesn't like to be pushed around, so you know, don't push around the earth. So 
problem. How can a horse pull a cart if the cart is pulling back on the horse with an equal but opposite force? A horse and a force, of course, of course. So aren't these balanced forces resulting in no acceleration? So you have the horse pulling the cart. So the force of the horse on the cart, the force of the cart on the horse, force of the cart on the horse. These guys are equal to each other. So how does that cart move? So these balance forces, aren't these balance forces around no acceleration? No, they are not. The explanation, forces are equal and opposite, but act on different objects. They are not balance forces. The movement of the horse depends on the forces acting on the horse. So in this case, the horse, the crappy color to pick, horse pushing down this way. But the horse is also pushing on the grounds. Uh, it's not just one action reaction pair. You got horse cart, cart horse. We also have ground horse, horse ground. Now the force of the horse pushing on the ground is greater than the force of the cart on the horse. So that's how the horse pulls the cart forward. Because the force on the ground is greater than the force of the cart. So when a bird flies, its wings push in a downward and backward direction. This pushes air downwards and backwards. So we have a wing, air pushes, it pushes air that way. By Newton's third law, the air pushes back on the bird in opposite directions. So the air is pushing on the bird this way. This force keeps the bird in the air and propels it forward. That's how birds fly. When you walk forward, you push backwards on the grounds. Your shoe pushes the earth backwards, and the earth pushes your shoe forwards. Here's your shoe. You actually push backwards and downwards a little bit on the earth. And here's the earth. It says, don't push me, I'm going to push you away. So it pushes you the opposite way, and that's how you're propelled forward when you walk. So earth has so much mass compared to you that it does not move noticeably when you push it. Because remember, the force of your shoe on the earth equals the force of the earth on your shoe. You might have a mass of 75 kilograms and you're moving forward at let's say 2 meters per second squared. That's your acceleration. So that's this guy. This guy over here, he's freaking enormous. Like, the mass of the Earth... Oh, crap. I thought I had this written down on my desk. I figured it out, though, right quick. Units, constant, mass of the Earth. So the mass of the Earth... Oh, that's an electron crud. Bear with me. You can skip this part while I find the mass of the Earth. I'm going to show you exactly why this is so big. Mass of the Earth. Here we go. Mass of the Earth is about 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. So what acceleration would the Earth have? in order for the force of the shoes on the earth to equal the force of the earth on the shoes. So we plug that in our calculator, 75 times 2. So the force of the shoe on the earth equals 150 newtons. And that's going to equal 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms times acceleration. So we got to divide all this by 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And you get an acceleration of 5.97 e 24. 2.51 times 10 to the negative 23 meters per second squared. Now that's pretty small. That's point one two three four. 
5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 2, 5, 1. You see, very, very small number. That's why you don't see the Earth move whenever you're walking. Kind of weird if it did. All right. So if you step on something that has less mass than you do, like a skateboard, you can see it being pushed backwards. So we step on a skateboard, you push back, you can see it move, unlike the Earth. So when the rocket fuel is ignited, so this is how rockets work. When the rocket fuel is ignited, a hot gas is produced. As the gas molecules collide at the inside of the engine walls, the walls exert a force that pushes them out the bottom. So all these gas molecules are bouncing around here going crazy, like, oh, we're going nuts. And then they get pushed out the back. So this downward push is the action force. The reaction force is the upward push on the rocket engine by the gas molecules. This is the thrust that propels the rocket upwards. So that's how rockets go up. They're pushing down. The air is pushing back up on them, and they fly. So in action-reaction pairs, both objects are going to accelerate. The amount of acceleration depends on the mass. So this guy right here is just Newton's uh, second law rearranged to solve for mass. So a small mass means more acceleration, and a large mass means less acceleration. So we can say that acceleration is inversely proportional to mass, or acceleration is proportional to 1 over the mass. Same difference. So you might have seen pictures of astronauts floating inside a space shuttle as it orbits the Earth. The astronauts are said to be weightless, but actually are they? If the force of gravity on the shuttle is almost 90% as large as at the Earth's surface. So they're still experiencing gravity, they're still experiencing 90% of the Earth's pool. So how are they considered weightless? We already talked about this a little bit in the, the last PowerPoint. So Newton's laws of motion can explain why the astronauts float as if there were no forces acting on them. So this kind of explains it with the elevator. We've already talked about the elevator. So when you stand on a scale, your weight pushes down on the scale. This causes the scale pointer to point to your weight. At the same time, by Newton's third law, the scale pushes up on you with a force equal to your weight. Now this is the normal force that the scale is pushing up on you with. This force balances the downward pull of gravity on you. Now suppose you're standing on a scale in an elevator that is falling. Now if you remember that problem I did on the last PowerPoint and the one before that. Like I said, cable snaps, elevator falls at 9.8 meters per second squared, you fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. You're all in free fall because gravity is the only thing acting on you. So because the only force on you is gravity, the scale is no longer pushing you up. So according to Newton's third law, you no longer push down on the scale. So the scale pointer stays at zero and you seem to be weightless. You're not actually weightless, it's just apparent weightlessness. So it should actually be titled free fall and apparent weightlessness. So weightlessness is the condition that occurs in free fall when the weight of an object seems to be zero. It's apparently zero. That's it. Hope you enjoyed this installment of Physics with Mr. G. Please tune in next time and we will talk about friction.